Today I will tell you guys about the Battle of the Somme, one of the three most talked about battles in World War I. You have Verdun, you have Ypres and you have the Somme. And we'll start with the prelude and then we'll end on the 18th of November 1918. When Germany invaded France through neutral Belgium, they were halted by the French at the Battle of the Marne. By the 22nd of September 1914, following the First Battle of the Marne and the First Battle of Aschny, the French and German armies began fighting a series of battles sidestepping one another through northern France in an attempt to outflank the other. These outflanking maneuvers would take them in a northwesterly direction from the Aschny region towards the French coast. This period of fighting became known as the Race to the Sea. When the fighting in World War I in the Somme arrived, the British Expeditionary Force uh, wasn't on this front line first. The French were here first in the Somme in 1914. The first outflanking attempt resulted in an encounter in the Battle of Picardy. Both sides then attempted another flanking move towards the north, which merged into the Battle of Albert. On the 25th of September, the French 2nd Army advanced eastwards, but instead of advancing round an open northern flank, they encountered the German 6th Army, which had attacked in the opposite direction, reaching Bapaume on the 26th of September and Tipfall the next day. The Germans had intended to outflank the French and drive westward to the English Channel, seizing the industrial and agricultural regions of northern France and isolating Belgium, and the French put a stubborn fight to protect the city of Albert. In Albert itself, the Germans suspected there was a French observation post in the bell tower of the cathedral, so they shelled the dome. The dome was destroyed and the base of the statue was hit and the statue was tilted alarmingly. The sculpture depicts a golden colored Virgin Mary holding its infant Christ high above her head. Artillery shells destroyed much of the town of Albert, but the statue of Mary remained attached towards the tower and it was badly tilted. Superstitious soldiers studied the sculpture daily. They wrote about her in the diaries and remarked that she was knocked over, threatening to fall over at any time. The messages about the statue were passed between the troops and it was often said, when the Virgin falls, the war will end. And soldiers also said, whoever knocked the statue down will lose the war. The statue became a symbol to British and German troops as soldiers remarked that the Virgin Mary was keeping the baby Christ from falling. By 1918, the German troops occupied the city of Albert and the British were shelling the tower to deprive the Germans of the high position. And the statue finally fell down towards the ground. The statue was never recovered and coincidentally the World War I ended on November the 11th 1918. And now back to the Battle of Arber itself. The French put up a fierce resistance to protect Arber. Neither side could defeat their opponent and the battle ended in a stalemate around the 29th of September. As both sides made another outflanking attempt towards the north of Albert at the Battle of Arras. After a number of fierce battles lasting into October and November, in which the Bavarians of the German 6th Army suffered heavy casualties, the German troops were ordered to hold their positions. Having stopped the advance in late 1914, the German divisions north of the Somme River selected good positions on high grounds to set up a line of defense with commanding views over the enemy lines. The defensive line north of the Somme River initially consisted of short trench sections and foxholes, incorporating villages and hamlets in or behind the lines, including Gommercourt, 
Serre, Beaumont Hamel, Tiepval, La Boisselle, Freekoord, Mamets en Montaban. During 1915, the German Second Army started an intensive program of construction on its front line and on the second line. Also a third line was begun some miles beyond the second position that consisted of strategically placed strong points. Several large deep bunkers were mined in the chalk landscape in the front line and the second position to provide unseen protective accommodation for headquarters, medical facilities, bodies of troops and supplies. In the front line sector, cellars underneath houses were reinforced as underground shelters and joined together by tunnels and trenches to create a fortified strong point such as at Serre and Bourmont Hamel. Barbed wire entanglements and deep, well-drained, solidly constructed trenches connected the village strong points in the forward areas. The rear area for the German divisions in the Somme sector was based at Bapalm. The town was a railhead for the sector. In order to supply the men in the line and in reserve, the German army started building and establishing bakeries, slaughterhouses, laundries, canteens, libraries, supply dumps, a hospital and forward medical stations in and around Bapalm. And after the Germans were establishing all that stuff, a new battle ensued north of Albert. A diversionary attack by regiments of the French 2nd Army on La Toutefant Farm, between Hebrutin and the Serre villages. The Germans had heavily fortified the farm on the front lines over the winter of 1914 and spring of 1915. The French succeeded in taking over the farm with losses of around 1,700 killed and over 8,500 wounded. The German losses were around 900 wounded, killed or taken prisoner. From August 1915, the British Third Army, commanded by General Sir Edmund Allenby, began to take over a sector of the front line north of the River Somme from the French Army. In December 1915, the new British front stretched from Ransart to Curlu on the Somme River. And around this time, the British Third Army was sandwiched between the French uh, 10th Army, holding 20 miles of the front line in the Arras sector, and the French 6th Army holding the front line south of the Somme River. And the British Army also existed of Pals Battalion. That was only the only army that used that kind of concept. The Pals Battalion of World War I were specially constituted battalions compromising of men who had enlisted together in local recruiting drives, with the promise that they would be able to serve along their friends, neighbors and colleagues, rather than being separated into different battalions. The practice of drawing recruits from a particular region or group meant that when a PALS battalion suffered heavy casualties, the impact on individual towns, villages, neighborhoods and communities back in Britain could be immediate and devastating. As an example, the Sheffield City Battalion, 12 York and Lancaster Regiment, had lost 495 dead and wounded in one day on the 1st of July on the Somme. So after they lost so many men on one specific area, like here at Buama Hamel, the leaders of the British Army abandoned the idea of the Pals Battalion in the army. The proposal for an offensive on the Somme battlefront was proposed by the Commander-in-Chief of the French armies, General Joseph Joffre, as the year of 1915 turned into 1916. 
originally intended as a combined Franco-British operation on both sides of the Somme River, the French reduced their participation to a supporting role in the operation as a result of the large-scale German attack on the Verdun Front from February 1916. The British 4th Army was formed in March 1916. It took over the Somme battlefront from the British 3rd Army between Fonquet village and Maricourt on the Somme River. The British operational plan for a offensive between Serre on the left wing and Maricourt on the right wing developed during April, May and June in 1916. It was approved that the British 3rd Army would commit two infantry divisions to a subsidiary attack at the same time as the main offensive against the heavily fortified German front at Gommercourt on the 4th Army's northern left flank. And on the opposite side of the uh, British positions, north of the Somme River, five German uh, divisions were stationed there to defend their front line, with four divisions in reserve. From the early spring into June 1916, the Somme battlefield sector behind the British and French lines was the scene of a huge build-up of troops, artillery and equipment in preparation for the large-scale offensive against the German defensive line. Trainings and large-scale rehearsals were carried out over a period of weeks before the attack. Tons of supplies and equipment, hundreds of guns, thousands of men and hundreds of horses arrived in the rear area ready for deployment to the forward lines to attack or support the attack. As part of the preparations for the large-scale British offensive against the German front line north of the Somme River, a mining program was carried out to lay 8 large and 11 small mines underneath key German positions. The British aim for the mines was to destroy known strong points or salients, uh, which were not considered possible to achieve a successful and swift frontal assault. The plan was to create gaps in the German line, cause confusion by the surprise of the immense explosions and knock the German defenders and strategic places down. And these mines were to be blown up on the first day of the British offensive. Right after the moment when the British and French infantry would leave their frontline positions, these mines would explode with the intention to smash the German positions, further weakening the German strength and shock the German survivors as the British made their assault along the German line. The artillery program was for a prolonged schedule of bombardments, the intensity of which had not been witnessed before on this battlefront. The bombardment was to wear down the morale and the nerves of the German defenders, cut through the German barbed wire defenses, smash the German frontline trenches and disrupt rear supply roads. The artillery program, issued on the 5th of June 1916, was for a preparatory bombardment to last for five days from the 24th towards the 28th of June. The Z day or zero day was scheduled for the infantry attack on the 29th of June. The plan of the British artillery bombardment was as follows. The first two days was to be devoted to the wire cutting and registration of the shelling. The next three days would focus on destroying the German defenses and smashing the enemy's barbed wire. For this bombardment, the British 4th Army would deploy over 1400 heavy guns and field guns, over 100 French field guns and howitzers, plus over 300 trench mortars. Due to the wet weather in the last week of June, the infantry attack was postponed to Saturday the 1st of July, providing two additional days of preparatory artillery bombardment. 
drawing the whole artillery bombardment to seven days in total. The seven day artillery bombardment was never seen before in modern warfare. Final preparations of training and planning were made by the British infantry during the days of the preparatory bombardment. Raids and patrols were carried out into German positions to capture prisoners and confirm which German units were holding the line. Reports about the wire being cut by the artillery bombardment were varied and at times conflicting. On the 30th of June, messages of encouragement were sent by the commanders towards the men and services were held in the rear area. Some units even held parades and were playing music. Equipment was cleaned and checked and letters were written to be sent off to the families. Each man collected his ammunition. Kits to be carried into battle were handed out. The troops fell into their unit and prepared for the march during the night into the assembly trenches in the forward area. Between 2 a.m. and 5.15 a.m., thousands of British troops made their way on a moonless but clear night along pre-prepared routes to the forward lines to be in position and ready for zero hour at 7.30 a.m. on the 1st of July. At 7.20 hours, 10 minutes before zero hour, a huge mine was detonated under Hawthorne Redoubt in the 8th Corps sector at Bour Mohamel. This position was a strong point on the German line and it was on the crest of the Hawthorne Ridge. And this was the only mine to be blown up underneath the German positions north of the Ancre River. The agreement to go ahead with the detonation a full 10 minutes before the infantry attack at zero hour and the fact that the heavy artillery was timed to lift off the German front line at the same time of the 10 minutes before zero hour gave the German troops sheltering in their dugouts and bunkers forewarning that the British attack was imminent. The mine explosion was filmed by a, a British war official cameraman, Geoffrey Mallins, and he filmed it on the exact location where I'm standing and the mine was blown up all the way over there. At 07.27 a.m., two mines were also exploded north of Carnoy on the 8th Corps front. At 07.28 a.m., three mines were detonated on the 15th Corps front under the German position, known as the Tambor, towards the west of Fricourt. And four small mines were detonated under the German lines at a place called the Hidden Wood, between Fricourt and Mametz. And also, at the same time as the previous mines, at 07.28 a.m., two very large mines were detonated on the third corps front on both sides of the Albert Papin road. The mine on the northern side of the road was at a position called YSAP. It contained 40,600 pounds of ammonal and was at the end of a 1,030 feet long gallery, the longest ever driven into chalk during the First World War. The mine on the southern side of the road near La Boiselle was at a position known as Lochnagar. 
it contained of around 60,000 pounds of ammonal explosives. It was split in between two charges around 52 feet deep. Following the explosion of the mines, the battle on the 1st of July 1916 began with the British infantry attack at zero hour, 07.30 a.m. The first day of the offensive on the 1st of July against the German front line comprised of this. A divisionary attack at Gommercourt on the northern side of the front was led by two divisions of the British 3rd Army. A center thrust of the British Somme offensive between Serre and the Marokut villages. This was carried out by 12 divisions in 5 corps of the British 4th Army, totaling over 100,000 men. Including a famous attack by the Newfoundland Regiment here at Bourmont Hamel. So at the village of Bourmont Hamel, the Newfoundland Regiment suffered catastrophic losses and more than 80% of the soldiers who advanced that day were either killed or wounded. In one morning, the regiment suffered around 700 casualties and of those 700, were approximately more than 300 were dead. Also, an attack astride the Somme River on the British right wing by two corpses of the French 6th Army. In some parts of the British line, troops had crawled out in front of the front line trench before zero hour. And at zero hour, whistles blew all along the British front line north of the Somme River. Thousands of British troops clambered over the top into no man's land towards the German front line. Within the first hour of the attack, the German defense inflicted heavy casualties to the British attacking force, resulting in the British being unable to reach their objective for the first day in most parts of the battlefront. The German defenses at ground level had been smashed by the preparatory bombardment. Although the successful effect of the British artillery shells on the barbed wire defenses in front of the German front line was varied. In some parts they were completely destroyed and in some parts they were fully up. Crucially, a key defensive feature in the German positions on this part of the Western Front was the series of mined bunkers and tunnel complexes they had dug deep under the chalky Somme landscape. For the most part, they advantageously withstood the hail of British artillery shells. Long months of intensive construction on this relatively quiet battlefront during 1915 provided the German 2nd Army with a very strong defense in depth. The British bombardment had caused disruption to the German supply routes and it disturbed the mental strength of the German troops, subjected to the noise and fear of death. Casualties in the German forward positions were serious enough in parts of the line for senior commanders to be concerned. But for the most part, the protection afforded by the numerous large underground complexes in the forward and supporting lines helped to limit German casualties. As the British began their advance, the Germans who had survived the caved in bunkers and had withstood the mentally strained time of the bombardment, they carried out a well-rehearsed drill of climbing out from their protection of their deep bunkers to man the smashed in trenches and most crucially their strategically placed machine gun positions. This had devastating consequences for most of the men in the British battalions advancing towards the Germans. Heavy casualties in so many sectors of the British attack, with large numbers of men wounded or killed by German bullets before they could even cross into no man's land, resulting in only a few small gains north of the Albert Mapain road. South of that road, on the far right wing of the attack, the British achieved significant success on the front between Mametz and Maricourt with the troops of the 18th and 30th divisions successfully reaching their objectives by the end of the day. 
the German defense was disorganized here and they were so low in morale that they were pushed out of their front line positions. The situation for almost all the divisions attacking north of Mamet's village turned into a desperate day of disappointment and loss. Small parties did indeed reach some of their objectives beyond the German front line in places. But the overwhelming loss of thousands of British troops to injury and death within the first hour of the attack limit the possibilities of supporting and reinforcing these gains by the end of the 1st of July. The 1st of July, 1916, the most tragic day in British Army history, with over 60,000 casualties and of which 19,000 were fatalities. And that was all just in one day. You, you don't really have even such days in World War II. And it's just insane to think about so many casualties. And the most of them usually died between, uh, within one hour or two hours of the attack. And there was a British officer who said it took two years to train them, but it took only 10 minutes for them to leave the front again. And now they left the front and lay here peacefully in their graves. Although the German regiments record relatively few casualties defending their line in the northern part of the battlefield, two of their regiments in the south sector, where the British had successfully made a breakthrough, were decimated each of them losing several hundred men as wounded, killed and taken prisoner. In the days that followed the launch of the offensive on the 1st of July up towards the 13th of July, the limited gains of ground captured on the first day of the battle south of the albert Popheim road were progressed in the German forward areas. The following fortified villages were captured by the British forces. The capture of Montalban on the 1st of July by the 30th Division. The capture of Mametz by the 7th Division. The capture of Fricourt by the 17th Division. The capture of Contalmaison by the 23rd Division. And the capture of La Boiselle by the 19th Division. Following the strategy of the first day of the battle on the 1st of July, with its heavy British losses and limited gains in capturing ground, the attempt to push the Germans back from their well-defended Somme front was continued. From this time, however, a large-scale attack with many divisions and thousands of men was not an option, following the severe loss of strength in casualties to the British 4th Army. The British commanders were now only in a position to regroup their units still available to them and narrow their objectives to take strategic locations in the German defences one by one. Battles continued into the following weeks as the British tried to break the German defence in a series of phased battles with limited objectives in a bite and hold sort of operation. The names of villages and woods on the Somme battlefields have become synonymous with the desperate fighting and tragic loss of both the British and the German armies during the four and a half months of these battles. The Battle of Basentin. The attacks at Highwood, a little bit further north of Basentin. The Battle of Delville Wood, also known as the British call it Devil's Wood. The battle was the debut of the 1st South African Brigade, part of the 9th Scottish Division, on the Western Front, which captured Delville Wood. And here, in Delville Wood, where the South Africans fought, and the British called this the Devil's Wood, absolutely everything was destroyed. There was no tree left, er literally everything was obliterated, except for one tree, and that tree still stands here today. Also, there were these battles. The Battle of Pozires, the Battle of Guillemont, the Battle of Ginchy, 
and the Battle of Flers Corselet, the first battle where tank warfare was used. By mid-September, the British were ready to assault the new German front line, and this time with a new devastating weapon, called the tank. Of 49 tanks available to support the infantry, only 36 reached their starting points. Flers and Corselet fell, but the advance on the 15th of September was limited to about 2500 yards, around 2200 meters. And after this, the tank would be vital for every new offensive that the British would undertake towards the Germans. The tanks would have been used in every war from that date, 15th of September 1916. Let's continue with these last battles. The Battle of Morval, the Battle of Chepval, the Battle of Le Transloy, the Battle of the Ankre Heights, and the Battle of the Ankre. The Battle of the Somme officially finally came to a close on the 18th of November 1916 as the weather worsened. The ground gained by the British 4th Army by the end of the fighting of almost 5 months moved the British front line just a few miles further northeast of its original position. Casualties of injured and death on both sides amounted to in the many hundreds of thousands. The dreadful irony of the situation would that be within 14 months the ground won at such a great cost to the British Army in 1916 would be swept back under control of the German army in the spring offensive of March and April in 1918. And by the time the Somme was abandoned, the Allies had only advanced 5 miles, around 8 kilometers, which is just insane to think about after all those years of fighting. The staggering losses that the Somme had seen included 650,000 German casualties, 420,000 British and 195,000 French. The battle became a metaphor for futile and indiscriminate slaughter. And what people usually forget about World War I is the job of animals in the war, which was so very important for the Allies and for the Germans in the war, like uh, the pigeons, the horses, the, the dogs, and yeah, it was so unbelievably important and there were so many casualties of animals in the First World War, which is also an insane amount. And where I'm standing now is a memorial of those animals that they will be remembered of World War I. The sun shining down on these green fields of France. The warm wind blows gently and the red poppies dance. The trenches have vanished long under the plough. No gas, no barbed wire, no guns firing down. But here in this graveyard that's still no man's land, the countless white crosses in mute witness stand. Till man's blind indifference to his fellow man, and the whole generation were butchered and damned. Okay, I want to thank you guys for watching this documentary about the Somme. I put a lot of effort in it and a lot of time, and of course traveling and all that stuff. Uh, so I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I also made a Patreon, so if you want to support me, you could do that there in uh, the Patreon. I put a, uh, will put a link in the description, so you can uh, see it there. Um, yeah, again, I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, documentary. We got the sun behind me, so we'll close the video with that one. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Salute!